All right. Hello, everyone. And thanks for joining early. We'll get started in just a moment. We're going to give people a few more moments to join. But um, I'm joined by Matt and um, Brian. So um, they're here to talk about migrations, and we'll be excited to get introductions um, over underway soon. In the meantime, if you let us know where you're joining in from, that'll be great. Um, just uh, click over to the chat channel and then post where you're joining in from. Looks like we have someone from California and North Carolina, which is awesome. I used to live on the East Coast. Maryland, not quite. Well, close is to North Carolina. San Francisco, great. Anyone outside of the US? Michigan, awesome. My wife. That's your wife. And partner. And partner. Awesome. Yeah, she's my partner in crypto raves. Ooh. What does she help out on, on crypto waves? Oh, she does a lot of the outreach, uh, writing, nice. um, mental support. <laughs> <laughs> needed very often. Definitely needed in this space with how fast everything changes. And I'm sure we'll chat about that soon. Absolutely. All right, Tahoe, lucky you, getting outside of the city, I'm assuming. <laughs> All right. All right. And we'll give it just a, a few more moments. Um, also, if you have any questions, feel free to ask them early. Um, there's a questions tab where you can um, post questions for Brian, um, Matt, or myself, and we'll be sure to get those answered for you. Welcome, Federico from Terra Games. Great to see you. Well, via text. <laughs> And looks like Chile as well. Nice. Great question. Also, if you can let us know what industries um, you know you're working with, and whether it's gaming, marketing tech, fintech, DeFi, let us know, and maybe we'll be able to squeeze in some questions about that when it comes to migrating too. All right, well, let's go ahead and get started. I think it'll be good to do a round of introductions first. So I'm Christine Perry from Scale Labs. And essentially what we do is we're building a layer two solution that allows you to run um, blockchains. Um, well, deploy your applications to a sidechain solution to speed up um, your application and lower the costs. So I'll get into more about that and a quick demo that I'll do to show you exactly how you're able to do that. But essentially what I do at Scale Labs is I run solutions engineering, which means that we um, deal with anything from um, helping customers understand the product and also helping them seek out partnerships as well as integrations along the way. So welcome. And then I'll pass it over to Brian. Thanks, Christine. I, um, I started out my, my tech tale, if you will. I started as a, as a humble chemical analyst so many years ago, I actually had a, a a degree in chemistry from college. And um, I began building applications to uh, make my life easier, well, number crunching programs to start. So as well as my coworkers. So I ended up in a position in that company, um, building systems out, honing my skills there. Um, and I was found making things more efficient um, was something I was always driven to do, you know, often very self-interested so i don't like repetitive work so um that was a driver for me um i ended up in real estate later building an in-house application and uh becoming like a full stack developer at that point um i did that for been doing that for well have done that for eight years and i uh discovered crypto in that time time frame and well if real estate wasn't boring before uh, it certainly was after I discovered crypto, so especially, uh, particularly Ethereum. And uh, so I, I just couldn't stop thinking about it. I ended up exiting eventually the real estate field 
and uh, decided to work on a dApp called Crypto Raves. Going on about two years now. Um, a little why why Crypto Raves um, found that I wanted to build something in the space that uh, engages users and to get them so educated on crypt, uh, just crypto principles and how crypto works. And we believe that a hands-on experience in that is what uh, is, a, is a great educator for teaching people these principles. Um, <clears throat> so, like, I, I imagine, like, the, one of the first times I did a blockchain transaction, or maybe you do too, if is kind of a, a moment where even if in the early days when it was super clunky and and uh, very slow, that transaction went through. So there, it was kind of a, a different feeling. It, it was a sort of an aha moment that I think uh, sort of opens you to like, oh, I, I think I get where this is going, this crypto thing. Uh, so I think that experience can sell itself. And we built crypto raves to um, get that in the hands of, of people in, in the streamlined way possible. Um, and hopefully I can make the case that layer two is crucial for uh, getting this experience to the end user and um, without these barriers like having to download MetaMask and gas fees and all the, the litany of reasons you want to go with layer two for a project like this. Um, so that's pretty much the story of how I got into that. So I think that covers all the intro bases. So, wow. and, and thank you. I, um, meanwhile, during that, I've been going to the meetups and, uh, and the uh, conferences, some of them. I met, uh, I learned about scale at East New York a year ago, uh, met Jack O'Halloran and, and uh, that piqued my in interest in the in scale project. And then of course, met you at East Denver this year, had mm -hmm. the pleasure of that and some other uh, scale members. And uh, so glad to have this uh, scale crypto raves relationship budding and culminating here with this talk. So thank you very much for putting it together, you and Celine and Appreciate the opportunity. That's awesome, Brian. Thanks for the intro. And we're really excited to dive into your project, especially so that way people can see how you can actually blend usability with a blockchain project. Because I think if you haven't tried out Crypto Raves, do it now. It only takes two minutes and you'll be up and running. It's super quick. And um, I won't ruin it for Brian because he's going to show you a demo. It'll be great. Um, but I want to pass it over to Matt for his intro as well. All right. Thanks, Christine. Um, yeah, I, to go along with what Brian was saying, I was just happy I didn't mess something up on my first crypto transaction. So, um, <laughs> but uh, my background is engineering, software engineering, and I, I work in, um, I've worked in the Internet of Things and uh, printing industries and got involved with uh, this uh, platform called the Nova Token platform. Uh, back in 2017, and I was doing some research for the company I work with on uh, crypto solutions and blockchain solutions. You know, always had a gaming background all the way back to, you know, a lot of board games through my life and video games up to a certain point. And um, so at, when doing the research, I came across this platform and the game that they had alongside it and got involved. Um, and, you know, over the past couple of years, we uh, ended up forming a new team. Uh, the original founder stayed on the new team. Uh, and just recently, we're also merging with the first uh, cryptocurrency in gaming uh, uh, game credits, and we're excited about that. What our our hope is to bring blockchain to every gamer. We're really uh, excited about making it easy for gamers to own their own in-game items and be able to transact those and be able to sell. You know, when they want to exit a game uh, and and move on to another game, and so um, the whole decentralized. Uh, community-driven approach to gaming is what we're all about at Game Credit. So we're excited about that and uh, glad to be on here. Thank you so much for having me and uh, excited to talk about, uh, 
you know, side chains and migration and all the things that surround that as we're in the middle of doing that with our side chain. We're, we're actually a hybrid solution and I'll get into that a little bit. Um, but <clears throat> the side chain is a really important piece of that and making it easy for gamers to transact. So. Yeah. And if you haven't visited Nova Tokens website, I definitely suggest if you're in the gaming industry, do so. They have an amazing developer portal and they're allowing you to be able to integrate with SDKs and REST APIs, which is technology that um, any developer is pretty much just like used to if they haven't gotten to blockchain yet. So definitely check them out. And really excited to talk about um, what the merger with game credits will look like a little bit here too. So. All right, great. Um, well, in that case, um, let's start the lightning demos. Um, and Brian, I think you're up first. Okay, let's see if I can do a quick screen share. Okay, are we seeing it? Whoop, everything look good? Okay. Um, so crypto raves, um, we're gonna target all big social media. We wanna meet the users where they're at. Um, we're starting with Twitter here and um, we wanna get that experience into their hands immediately without barriers, like I said. So um, our main product that we offer is a launch your personalized token uh, right with a tweet. So this is, um, can be done pretty simply just by summoning crypto raves account and at crypto raves hashtag drop my crypto and you send that tweet out and it will launch you 1 billion of your own personalized tokens stamped with your Twitter handle name. And um, I won't do that with this account. The whole process takes a round trip of a minute, so we don't have that time to spare, but um, that's all it takes to get started. Um, I'll just jump right to sending some crypto raves. And it's, it's very similarly is easy. What is that? One million? Why not? Um, I'll send some to Christine and appreciation. And that's certainly how we think of these tokens is tokens of appreciation. And, um, so there it's, it's sent, it's off. I'll, uh, sort of await the tip bot takes about 20 seconds for that to process. But what we do see is folks um, using uh, these tokens. Uh, that's like one of the main natural things they gravitate to. As soon as they launch their token, they start going around and tipping, uh, I should say just giving uh, some of their appreciating content on Twitter and um, giving to, in response usually to something they appreciate. Um, and so, Sometimes a refresh is faster. It should come back shortly with a response from our, our crypto uh, Twitter bot. And what's kind of going on in the background is uh, it's sending the Twitter API sends to our backend and then our, um, our uh, system logs the uh, transaction on the blockchain. Uh, I'm seeing it. Oh no. Let's see. Did I send it right? Oh, maybe there it is. There it is. So you get a, a, a this is a, if all, all goes well, you get this type of response. You get a fun little uh, inspirational quote and then a link that I will now take you to our website. And it's a confirmation page. So this is your basic confirmation um, data here. So who it's from. Me, Cartosis, uh, the amount to Christine, and then the token type, and you can send uh, any token that you hold. Um, so that's a cool feature. Down here, you have the transaction hash, and that's a link to the layer two block explorer. So you can see the actual transaction on the blockchain. And um, this uh, is our special sauce here because any other crypto Twitter bot doesn't even use layer two they're all centralized so um, we are this makes us the de facto most most decentralized crypto twitter bot in the space um because every transaction is on the blockchain and that's been compelling to our users 
many of them. Um, the bird is the link to the tweet that generated this. Um, clicking on a profile pic will take you to that person's portfolio page and you can cycle through different views of transaction data. Um, there's also a basic transaction history, but um, so this portfolio, these are all users that have launched their own token on crypto raves and were kind enough to send me some. And so I have a portfolio of their tokens, which is pretty cool. I have here um, also the inverse view, uh, the holders or holders of our token, of the tokens that I've given to others. Um, so basically a, a network of token holders of the Cartosis token. So between these two, um, something cool we've, we've discovered is um, we can make a sort of tally up the amount of tokens of all the holders and of all those you hold, and then the number of users as sort of a Metcalf's law for the geeks equation that creates a, a kind of a point system. And uh, we've created a leaderboard from that. So the highest score that you have on here basically means that you have a, a high, uh, very diverse uh, set of holders of tokens and then also plus all the tokens that you hold um, and a, a diverse and depth, in-depth portfolio of tokens. So our, a lot of users have had a lot of fun with that and that's that's been a pretty cool feature. Um, so one more thing I wanna show real quick is our latest feature and that is the Web3 portal. And so this is where you will need a MetaMask wallet because this is the uh, transfer a deposit withdrawal interface between layer one mainnet and layer two. Um, so just briefly, you can see that on the left-hand side, there's um, the uh, CryptoRaves layer two wallet. And on the right-hand side, your MetaMask wallet. And it's a, a quick step-by-step -step setup process one time that you can do to deposit tokens to and from. We offer a few tokens, a couple tokens right now. Um, to do that. And that's uh, this VOIA token we partnered up with. Um, this is at Vela token on Twitter. A little shout out, but they are a layer one uh, native token that we brought over into layer two and crypto raves. And uh, they have a following that likes a tip with their tokens. Um, also, the crypto raves official token can uh, be deposit withdrawn. Um, our goal is to have every, eventually every ERC20 here in a list, as well as NFTs um, just moving constantly to and from mainnet to crypto raves. I think that would be awesome. And that's definitely our aim. Um, so I won't go through the full withdrawal process. I'll just kind of get one started since mainnet can lag sometimes, but it's just a couple of uh, signatures required to authorize layer two to send the tokens over. And then um, a final pay for the a confirmation to pay for the gas to get those tokens into your wallet. So don't need to wait for that. Um, so I hope I've demonstrated these are the main features. Um, yeah, go ahead and try to drop your crypto today on Twitter. Um, I, I think I've made the case that how this would not have gotten but a small fraction of the traffic. That, that we have seen the traction from users if if we didn't have a layer two solution. Um, so between the zero zero fees and the constant MetaMask, imagine doing those MetaMask signatures every time you sent one over Twitter, um, for example. Um, we've, uh, I've, I've, we've onboarded over a thousand, uh, well, we have a, over a thousand uh, droppers crypto droppers who've launched their own token, 3,000 unique users, 7,000 plus transactions um, so far as of October. So we've seen some traction. It's been exciting and um, looking forward to furthering the discussion with scale. Awesome. And uh, regarding layer two, I'll try to unshare. It looks like you're getting questions already. Um, so one of the questions that came right. in is how do gas fees work with crypto raves and the created tokens? Um, we would, uh, as, as long as feasible, we'll recover all gas um, just with uh, the seed money we put in. 
um, for now. Um, in fact, and with uh, Loom, we were grandfathered into a free plan, um, but that's how I see it going to start, see uh, what kind of traction we get just from um, the DAP paying the gas in this case. All right, sounds great. Thanks for the demo, Brian. Um, and Matt, Absolutely. Thank you. Matt um, let's see a demo of uh, game, game credits and Nova token. Yeah, thank you, uh, sure. So uh, let me share my screen. So, um, yeah, we're so this is our web page, and it just just to give a sense of what we're trying to do with uh, the game credits platform, we're trying to make it easy for both gamers and game developers to uh, take part in the blockchain. Um, so, um, one of the, a couple things we're working on with our version 1.0, and some of this stuff already exists. Um, some of it is in development and we're hoping and shooting for a summer release uh, timeframe, uh, but we want to have the ability to have a marketplace uh, for buy and sell of uh, in-game items. Uh, we want to be able to explore in-game items and, you know, um, have a foundry for games to be able to go in and mint items. So, you know, imagine a game and a set of items that you release, you would be able to go in and mint them and then send them to your players, uh, either when they buy buy something in the in-game experience or, you know, as a distribution, there's a lot of different ways we can do it. And then also we, we actually have been running the reward system for a while, um, but uh, we right now we've probably given away, you know, we've given away probably 3 billion NVT tokens, uh, which has real world value already. Uh, just from the utility, and then also uh, we're we're going to begin giving away game credits um, uh, token. It's an ERC uh, seven, uh, twenty token that we're working on right now. So that that promotion will be forthcoming as we merge the Nova token platform, as I mentioned, uh, and the game credits uh, communities. We're merging those two things, um, and then eventually we'll have an esports tournament system where players can enter into a trustless tournament where, you know, you pay in a certain amount and there's an automatic transaction in the back end and players are rewarded for first place, second place. They could be re re rewarded in NFTs. So it depends on how uh, games want to implement that, but they can do it all within the confines of a game. And we're really focused on indie games and, um, you know, games that are trying to innovate and do new things and engage in the blockchain, at, at least at first. So we're excited about that. So I'm gonna take into um, the game rewards uh, developer and rewards portal. So right now I have 10,000 game that I can stake. So this is the staking portal. And these are real games that have signed up and partnered with us. Um, and you can see that uh, people have already staked on these games. And I mentioned that we're sort of a hybrid solution. So the staking process where players stake against certain games is actually done on mainnet. And then the token system is done on the side chain. And we worked with Loom in the past and we're in the process of migrating. Um, and part of the reason for this uh, uh, webinar and get together here, um, but you can see the games there. And I'm gonna actually go in and stake some of my tokens against this particular game. Um, so I'm going to set my stake. This is this is on the Coven network. Um, the Nova Token website, which was our original website, is on the live Ethereum network. Uh, and this will transfer over early into the Ethereum uh, live network. So I set the my stake. And me personally, I've probably earned, you know, up. 50 million Nova tokens from staking, just from the giveaways in the community and so forth. So I've, I've earned quite a few Nova tokens in the past, and then we'll do the same uh, process with, uh, um, you know, the game, cre game credits and the game. Uh, and 
And the other thing that we want to do is we're giving out sort of loyalty points for staking as well. So games can kind of decide how they want to do this. So if I stake, uh, say, a million uh, tokens, I may earn 10 NFTs and they may be of various rarity or however the game wants to do that. And the APIs that we have make that really easy. So that that's kind of the staking process. Now I've staked uh, 1,000 game and depending on how much I stake, the rewards will be assigned to me. Right now it's showing zero probably because I just haven't done enough. Um, and it's a percentage. And in addition to players who stake against certain games, uh, the games themselves earn reward relative to the amount of stake. So it's kind of like a popularity contest. You know, if more people stake against your game, you're going to get more of the reward share each week that we give out uh, rewards or um, and also discounts into, um, you know, into the use of the system as we make it available to games. So I, I actually created a game here. And one of the things that we've done a lot of work in is we actually manage permissions all, uh, all within the blockchain. So, you know, for this particular game I created, I'm the admin right now. And my, my wallet is sort of my authentication into being able to go in and edit this game. And you'll see on the left side there, you can uh, see what your rewards are. You can change the metadata associated with the game. So I haven't gotten any rewards here for this game yet because I, I just, uh, actually no one staked, I just created this game. So no one staked against this game. Um, but if someone staked a bunch of tokens on my game or a bunch of people staked on it, the game would actually earn a percentage of the overall rewards that are being being given out. And I mentioned that there's roles. So right now I'm the admin with my uh, MetaMask wallet here. And so once I'm signed into MetaMask, I'm authenticated and I can do all, uh, all of the actions related to the game administrator. And I can also add in uh, operators as well. So there's different roles and permissions that sort of allow you to control it all from a decentralized, uh, all as a decentralized approach using your MetaMask account. Um, and then I can go in and add new sets. And so a set is a collection of cards or items, however you want to envision that. And then each card is sort of like a, a uh, template for uh, NFTs that would be created. So if you bought uh, one of the, uh, like, say, let's say you're playing an online card game, uh, like a collectible card game, and you bought a pack, you would get, you know, you bought that pack and you got 10 F NFTs. Those would be minted automatically through our API and then distributed to your wallet. And we actually, one of the things that we do really well is we, we actually make it seamless for players to be a part of this. Um, so essentially they can they can be playing a game and buying in-game items and not even know it. So the transition of when they want to, um, when they want to start selling things, it's whenever they want to get involved with crypto. And I think that was one thing, uh, you know, with crypto raves, it's like easy onboarding uh, for new people. That's one of the things we really want to do is make it easy to onboard. And the side chain is really critical to that um, because it allows us to do it inexpensive and, not have that upfront fee um, to the person with the wallet. I think we take the fee as part of our, uh, you know, as part of our platform cost, almost like a cloud cost, if you will. And then we uh, use that as a way of onboarding players. And, and so. Matt, and it looks like you got a question as well. Um, and I'll read it off to you. Um, looks like I'm sure you've heard of the trouble Steam got into in regards to game skin gambling sites involving children. What sort of solutions do you believe would help prevent this issue resurfacing within the blockchain gaming space? Yeah, I think that's definitely something that's a challenge. It's um, So as we go to various platforms, as games uh, have a part in our platform, it's definitely a challenge. I think one of the benefits of doing it on the block blockchain is the security um, and you know that these things this this is something that's um, you know it's decentralized so 
the problem with steam was it was all centralized and you know they um they controlled uh all of the data and you know it was difficult for them to and and it was it was difficult for them to uh, manage that. Now, this would be so in the blockchain world. There's already games that are doing this. You know, uh, you may have heard of Gods Unchained, uh, mm -hmm. which is an car, online card game. They're already doing it on the Ethereum network. We're making it easy to do it, um, and we're being upfront about it in terms of our offer. Um, and so, yeah, I, I hopefully that that answers some of the question. I think it's it's tough. Uh, because each platform you go on is going to have their own rules about, you know, whether they allow or not allow. And so we're, that's one of the reasons why we're targeting uh, indie games. You know, players spend a lot of money on games and then that money is gone. It's in the, pla it's in the Steam platform and they can't get it back out. Yet, if you collected a baseball card and you save, uh, you know, you had the Mickey Mantle rookie card and you save that, um, and it's now it's worth thousands of dollars. You have the right and the freedom to sell that how you will. Um, so I think the fact that the data is actually owned by the player and controlled by the player on, on chain gives them uh, control of how it's, uh, you know, how it's transferred and how it's sold and how much it's sold for. All right. Thanks, Matt. Yeah. Um, and I think the next question is probably good to kind of like roll into, um, you know, the panel, which is why we're all here, kind of talking about, um, you know, what it would take to like migrate both of your applications over to another layer two solution outside of Loom. Um, now, Loom did a really good job with like spearheading the layer two space and providing like developers with a way to enhance their dApps. Um, but what were your deciding factors um, for incorporating Loom in the first place? I'll go ahead. Uh, for for us, um, they they were ready when we needed a, a layer two solution. They had um, a test net that I was in, ready in parallel while I was building that I could just deploy onto. And then they, the following January, this was a year ago, uh, they launched their main net and we were ready to go. So it was it was a matter of timing why we went with Loom. I was impressed with their um, project um, earlier on. Um, so I, I, I felt drawn to, to Loom as a, as a ready solution um, then because I don't, I, the other solutions I explored before, they didn't have as, you know, as, were as well documented. Um, Loom, Loom also had like other projects that were um, going strong on their, on their platform. And then they, big part of, um, Another big part of the decision was there the excellent uh, Crypto Zombies tutorial for um, the Solidity development. I, I was very impressed with that too. So, combination of some of their products and the other projects that were building on it, and that they were early in was was why I went with them initially. Yeah, and I think we we had a similar. Yeah, we had a similar choice process if, if you will for for loom um i think it was the speed of the transactions um and when in the side chain we were looking for the potential to scale up um and the cost structure we we basically followed your typical engineering principles when selecting a technology solution does it meet your requirements performance reliability um and you know cost those sort of things we just so it was an evaluation and then the way we designed it out we also knew that you know because a lot of these things are new technologies there is the um there's always the chance that they could change uh their business model and then we don't have a solution on the side chain which was so important to what we were doing so we had to make it um you know essentially easy to change, um, uh, decoupled is the word I was looking for. So we, we made sure it was decoupled and we're sort of primed now to move away from Loom already um, and awaiting some of the great things from scale. Um, 
And so, you know, um, I think it's, it's a matter of designing it and going through the right engineering and not being too closely tied for your platform um, to any given solution that hasn't been, uh, over, you know, hasn't been established yet. So, so uh, that, that, that was the thing for us. And uh, yeah. Um, and to dive into that a little bit more, because I'm assuming, you know, the recent merger with Nova Token and Game Credits, would that impact um, a difference in like your scalability needs moving forward? Will you need um, new features or are you looking for more or less the same um, type of platform for layer two solution? Yeah, we're really the, uh, the Game Credits uh, was definitely a brand play. Uh, so they didn't have a real strong technology solution, whereas the Nova Token platform had a lot of development put into it. And so that merge really was the business side, the game, cre the game credits uh, brand, which was the first crypto gaming currency with uh, the technology of the Nova token platform. So we're just, you know, uh, so there isn't a lot changing from the technology side. Um, and so we're, we're sort of poised and ready um, to really grow here with, with and expand and get games to adopt the platform. Got it. Um, and I guess it's like, you know, moving on to, um, you know, usability, as I know, Crypto Raids, you're doing a really good job with that. Um, we saw how easy it was to like onboard. And user experience is finally being addressed, like within blockchain space from a lot of projects now, which in turn is helping developers reach a wider audience and adoption. And I imagine, you know, your user played a huge role in being able to help remove some of that friction with usability because you didn't have lower transaction costs and, um, uh, well, you have more transaction costs and also the transactions were faster. But I'm assuming storage plays a role in here too. Um, and I remember one of you mentioning that we need to be smart about what we can store on chain and off chain. So can you explain more about that, your decisions to like move on um, things off chain and what you chose to move on chain? Yeah, if you don't mind, I could start with that one. Um, so for us, storage, you know, is metadata related to in-game items. So in some cases that might be attributes that you want to evolve as you play a game. So like, for example, uh, a, a, a sword or a shield levels up in the game and you want that to carry over and be sellable from one player to another as part of your game design. Um, so that, that storage is definitely a consideration for us. What do we store on chain? And then how do we prove that that item is still the state when it was transacted? So it's legitimate to the player. And there's only so much you can store when you're dealing with potentially uh, millions of in-game items. Like if you had a hundred games that adopt our platform and each game had, you know, a thousand different items, then, and then each player has, you know, hundreds of those items in different forms and variations, the numbers start to grow exponentially. So um, we need to be able to store data both on chain so that the player knows that that is really data that's theirs and controlled by their private keys. And then also there's some cases where you're providing more like metadata that goes along with it. And that that it's almost like a hybrid approach, like mm -hmm. images and that sort of thing. Um, so, yeah. Uh, and we're investigating things. I mean, Scale has a, a piece of their solution where they you can do storage on chain. And then there's, there's uh, technology like IPFS that we're investigating. So longer term, we can do more with storing game related items or games themselves on chain. Mm -hmm. Yep, uh, piggybacking off of Matt there, as, as far as like when we incorporate NFTs, I see there could be a, a need for storage as far as storing metadata for that, um, including images um, for individual NFTs and or um, um, the metadata involved with with that. Um, I, I think also as the raves evolves you know we look to have any sort of no limits on what uh, smart contracts um features available through the um, crypto raves interface 
so yeah, it's, it's definitely something we're always uh, thinking about um, in terms of incorporating at some point. Um, I see that that first need with with NFTs once those are onboarded. Got it. Um, and I, I like this question that's coming in from the audience because um, it flows really nicely. Just how important do you think it is to be able to move between um, like a mainnet and a sidechain solution? Um, is there too much emphasis on the um, ability to have like this interchain messaging, if you will, or is it really okay to move things off chain and just access them um, separately without having to, I guess, resave state back to the mainnet? Yeah, I see it as, so I th we, one important feature that we are moving into as I demonstrated is, is to have uh, tokens freely move in and out of the platform as possible. Um, I think with our specific use case being on Twitter and a public um, um, social media platform, you know, a lot of people are and, and projects would take interest in having tokens tweeted live in, you know, with, in a, with an audience. Um, we think that's great marketing. It's been great marketing for us. Um, so I think to have a free flowing tokens back and forth is, is definitely key. Um, one feedback we get from users is as many of them, even as soon as they launch their token on crypto raves, they immediately want to take them off. So that's just FYI. One thing that we, we hear frequently, they, they want, they want to move their brand new token, shiny new tokens to mainnet. Um, so that's um, a, a feature request there um, that we've been looking to build out. Um, so, and, and I just sort of see it as, okay, like in a crypto raves case, uh, users launch a token and it's just sort of a, a trivial thing, right? Not worth much, but you know, if it's somebody builds a, a reputation online and, and perhaps become famous or what have you, gain a lot of social value um, with their token, then they could say, move it on to mainnet um, for the, the greater security. Um, so we, I like this to think of it as tokens that are ready to fly, can fly onto mainnet and go onto the exchanges where it's paradise, right? Um, so that's, that's kind of like how I see the, the dichotomy of layer one, layer two, or how I see their relationship as far as, uh, um, the crypto raves case goes. Um, yeah. Got it. All right. So then do you have to balance any um, potential loss of functionality and how did you deal with that in the past and how are you looking forward to dealing with that in the future as you're migrating? Cause I would assume, you know, with any migration, there comes a time for um, most engineers to think about re-architecting how they're using their current solutions today. Um, does, you know, does your migration impact that at all or um, drive you to want to seek out um, a project that does have more functionality that you can play with? Um, so looking at opportunity in the chaos, um, <laughs> I've, I've seen, I, I've eyed towards, okay, actually building in additional features mm -hmm. during this, this time, you know, as development where it goes, I mean, sometimes you get to a point where you just have to kind of start from scratch if you want to move forward in strides. Mm -hmm. um, so as part of the software life cycle, um, it's it's kind of, you know, I like to spin it as good timing that, uh, yeah, it's, it's time to, you know, redive in and re do some refactoring of the code and rebuild in the next few steps of the um, roadmap that, that we were aiming for anyways. And um, so I think it, it's just kind of a, a good time for housekeeping and, and also building perhaps a few couple new features in um, during this time. Um, I don't quite yet see a, a loss of functionality. Um, we were using very basic functionality to, to begin with. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I, that's going to be worry free for, for us in that regard, I think. Fingers crossed. Yeah, fingers crossed. Um, don't worry, I'll get to show everyone a demo at the very end. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to see what a migration yeah. truly looks like, but uh, definitely want to get you know your initial thoughts around um, how you're perceiving this migration going. Um, and Matt, yeah. um, anything to add with that around um, you know how you're going to um, manage the transition and whether or not um, you want to seek out like using some of the new features that you may have access to on a different solution. Oh, um, you're muted, Matt. Looks like you're muted. 
So yeah, for us, because, um, you know, because we haven't launched our side chain where mm -hmm. users are actively using it right now, we're only, we only have our main net launched. Uh, there's less risk, I think, with migration. Um, but uh, I think we've already seen the benefits and um, some of the issues we had specifically with really detailed stuff in Loom and how from um, their network that were, were, you know, based on the interfaces that we uh, implemented instead, just standard Ethereum interfaces, you know, um, and <clears throat> working with scale will be very similar to working with Ethereum, except it's on a side chain. We're expecting that those issues will likely go away. And I think it was just Loom's um, API. And so we're excited kind of about that because it made us do things that, you know, were less real time. Uh, we had to do polling on their network and trying to retrieve data. And so uh, that's that was one that was one hiccup we had with Loom that, um, you know, now we're starting it. We've built it out, uh, you know, using um, some of the other providers, out, uh, you know, with the Web3 providers out there. And so we're excited about that um, being solved for us. So, uh, but in terms of the production issues, we haven't had to deal with those yet because we haven't launched yet, um, but we are uh, poised and ready, so to speak. As we um, migrate. So this migration thing is really important to us right now. So, yeah. That's exciting to hear. Um, and then I'll just end with this last question then. Um, you know, currently our developer test net um, is not available for new DAP projects with test functionality yet. So none of these projects have tested, um, but we will get them up and running soon. Um, however, one of the things that's really key to scale is that developers don't have to learn new code or learn a new process to onboard. In fact, it should be just as seamless as what you were doing before. And it mirrors Ethereum pretty much to the T. And so without testing, what are some of the reasons that drove you to the scale network and makes you look forward to potentially migrating over? Speak for the, um, the outreach that scale does. Um, I've met them, met you guys at the conferences. Um, so like the, the community outreach has been um, um, very enticing and and that's something that uh, Loom certainly didn't do. I never saw any of them at the at the meetups or the conferences or anything, and and are having any sort of outreach activities uh, up to this degree, um, like uh, like these uh, roundtable discussions. So um, that is something that's that's very attractive um, to us. And um, so, and I, I I just follow the news and and follow what Scale's doing in the space, and it's. Um, it's been impressive, and so it's been uh, exciting to uh, to watch and and sort of you know rub shoulders here. So, looking forward to continuing the discussion for sure. Yeah, yeah, and we had and, and so we had gotten a note from the Loom developers, you know, basically telling us that you got to find another side chain solution because they're pivoting to a different market, um, some enterprise stuff, and it was kind of, it kind of took us by surprise. But you know, one of our developers was. Um, like Brian mentioned, he was at some of the, the, the ETH conferences and met you guys and learned about your solution. And he was the one that recommended it. Uh, and, you know, ba Paul Barclay, who was who's one of the founders of the he was the founder of the Nova Token platform. And he's our CTO. Um, you know, he was immediately impressed by this, both the similarities of the, you know, the technical specs, like how it performs but also the general, you know, that the implementation would be um, so similar to what we've already been doing on mainnet and so forth. So, so I think it was, I think it goes just along with what Brian said, but also um, that key aspect that it's so similar to the mainnet implementation. Awesome. Thank you, guys. Um, thanks for the great feedback. You know, we really enjoy working with all of you, too. I think what's really fun for us is seeing all the um, projects that are building within the blockchain space and coming up with new ideas, but also, as both of you are doing, keeping usability in mind and really just trying to help others, um, you know, um, get a hold in the space as well. So I think what will be great is kind of like show both you <laughs> and the community what it actually looks like migrating to scale. 
Um, and so I'm going to do a, a short demo so that way everyone can see um, what they'll hopefully be able to look forward to. And there will be just a moment. So um, most people have landed here on our developer page where you can just kind of like see how easy it is to get up and running. And we try to break it down to four simple steps where you request a scale chain and we'll be getting you um, those as soon as we can. Um, you prepare your scale chain by um, getting test ETH because this is a test net. So just like Rink B, you go to a faucet, we give you um, test ETH. Um, but there's no gas transaction for your end users because you're paying for it up front, sort of like an AWS um, but for blockchain model, where um, you pay for the amount of space and the amount of speed that you need at any given time. Your end users then don't have to um, pay for every transaction, such as like clicking a button. So for something like crypto raves, if they had to um, deal with MetaMask every time that they were trying to deal with that integration with through Twitter, that would be really annoying. And so we remove um, that feature. Um, from the blockchain. The next thing you do is you migrate your smart contracts using tools that you're familiar with. So I'm assuming that, Brian, you, you use Truffle, you've heard of it. Yes. <laughs> well, it's going to be so exactly built on our back end is Truffle. Yes. Perfect. Perfect. Um, and so this is like really um, straightforward because a lot of developers have heard of Truffle. You usually start here. Um, but if you're deploying using any other tool, um, whether it's um, Ether.js, um, Web3.js, Node.js, whatever you're using to deploy or connect to the blockchain, you can use that for a scale as well. The only thing you change is your endpoint. And so the migration really is this simple. <laughs> Assuming that you wrote your smart contracts in Solidity, you don't have to change much. In fact, you point it to scale just as if you're using an Infura endpoint, you enter in your private key and you make that transaction go, again, using the same tools and the same commands you used before, but this time just pointing it to scale. So again, we tried to make it as accessible as possible to where you can still even incorporate MetaMask or any API-based wallet of your choice. Because I think, Brian, you pointed this out. Like, If you have to constantly use MetaMask for a sidechain solution, when you're really just trying to speed it up, that's also going to defeat the purpose. Where using another API-based wallet solution such as Portis, Bitsky, um, or building your own will help you use a sidechain to its full potential. Um, so I want to show you what that looks like. But I am going to use MetaMask since it is very accessible. Um, and Remix, which is another um, easy to deploy tool that developers usually get started with. And so I have this coin here that you can see. I'm going to go to deploy. Now, the only thing you have to change um, within MetaMask, um, unfortunately, they don't allow you to manually change it as a developer, um, dynamically change it as developer. So the end user would have to enter in the endpoint here. But again, if you're using an API-based wallet where you can manage it all on your side, you can automatically switch the user over from Ethereum to scale and back again, as Crypto Reyes has showed you that he did on um, his Twitter. So here, um, I have this connected to scale. And if I want to deploy, one of the things you'll notice is that, again, like I said before, we remove the idea of gas costs for end users because they shouldn't be concerned about this. When you've already paid for the scale chain up front, we are not going to double charge, but again, adding a gas cost here. So when you confirm, one of the things you'll see is that it's lightning fast. So instead of having to wait sometimes 15 minutes if you're deploying a large contract on um, Ethereum or Ring Fee, um, it happens in a matter of seconds. And you can interact with it in the same way. Now, the reason why I deployed a coin is because I have this game that I've created in Unity that I'd love to show, which is a really cool um, example. And essentially, it's just this world where I have a few things here. I have my go-kart, um, but I also have scale coins that I created. They're ERC tokens where they're on the racetrack here, and you can see it here. It's the little Ethereum sign. But as my player is moving around the racetrack, um, essentially, it's connected to the blockchain. And what I did was I used a package called an Ethereum. So if you get in the gaming space, you're building on Unity, you may have used this package before where it allows you to connect to any blockchain um, that's Ethereum-based, including Scale. And so this is a real-world example just kind of showing you that um, you can easily deploy um, you know, a smart contract to Scale and connect to usually Unity game app by just entering in the endpoint. Now, again, um, I say this every time, but please don't steal my fake ETH with my insecure um, you know, private keys here. But you know, the, tech, the, the solution is more or less the same. Essentially, you are able to build out your um, game connected to scale. 
and then send transactions using Ethereum package, which again, this is Ethereum based based off of C sharp. But if you're using um, ether.js or web3.js or web3.python, it'll work exactly the same way. You enter your endpoint, you connect it up to your connector and you're ready to go. So to show you this in action, this is how it works. And hopefully um, this plays in real time while streaming. Um, it is pretty fast, but what you'll see there on the bottom right-hand side is just my balance scale tokens and, of course, the player balance. Look like I had already played this before, so I have a few tokens. But what you're seeing is every time I hit a coin, it transfers it directly to my wallet in real time. And so this allows you to create any sort of um, connection into your scale child chain solution while still making it um, really usable for the end user because they don't know that's a blockchain. They're just able to play the game. But on the back end, you made all the connection happen and made it faster by linking it to scale. So just wanted to show that quick demo just to show how easy it would be to um, migrate your applications, guys. Awesome. Not a bad driver either. <laughs> I hit the wall a few times. Um, we'll definitely have to um, put it up there for other people to try. <laughs> All right. So the migration, um, again, um, one of the things that you guys pointed out is that we do hope that it will be super seamless for you. Um, migrating from Loom, Loom, they definitely have um, a system where you're able to use Web3 connectors, connect to their side chain solution, and you're going to have the same experience with us. There are some key differences though. Instead of having to share space on one massive um, blockchain, we don't make you share space. Every application gets their own scale chain. And so with doing that, it means that you don't have to worry about another application coming in, eating up all the resources, and then suddenly your app runs slow. That won't happen for you due to containerization. Um, what's really cool though, is that um, one of the things that you guys talked about was storage and what comes standard with each scale chain is file storage. So when I was asking about, um, you know, using new features, that was one of the things I was um, getting at. Like, if you could like have a way to store files in a decentralized way, would you potentially use that? Because with a scale chain solution, instead of having to implement IPFS, it comes standard where you can use an NPM package or use a smart contracts to store your files in a centralized way. So um, really excited to, um, of course, have both of you um, test out the migration over from Loom to Scale and looking forward to getting you up and running. Um, but we did have a few more questions from the audience. I want to make sure that we get everyone's questions answered. So if you have any questions now, um, definitely feel free to add them in as we're going through them. Um, but let's switch over to the questions tab. And looks like this one was for um, Matt. So I like the platform, congrats on the project. What kind of transactions do you plan to register on the side chain? And do those transactions affect the game balance? Was this just for either? Uh, um, oh, looks like Matt disconnected. Oh, it sounded like more specific to Matt. Yeah. Um, but with crypto raves, we wanted uh, every transaction to be on the blockchain. So, um, yeah, so that's, that's, um, even, even the most trivial, I suppose, um, will, will get registered on there. Um, because even though now we have a centralized backend, um, we're working with, uh, a chain link actually to decentralize the, um, <clears throat> the, the data that we get from Twitter. Um, uh, and also, that so like the last step is is to um abstract away our role in managing wallets and so i see having everything on the on the side chain as as a crucial function to to be for our, our path to full decentralization um so yep everything everything on the blockchain awesome awesome and let's see uh, it looks like the, the other question um, was more specific to, I think, the cards for Matt, too. Um, so whoever um, posted that question, looks like Matt is replying. So you should be able to get a, um, your answer soon via text. Okay, let's see other questions here. 
All right, is Scale a scaling solution solely for games wanting to launch an Ethereum blockchain? Uh, the answer is no. Um, we definitely work with a lot of different DApp developers among um, different verticals. Gaming and DeFi, as you can imagine, it um, covers about 50% of it though. Um, one, because it's a, definitely a, a clear use case for blockchain technology, but one of the things that we were surprised by was that we see other dApps building within the social impact space and the real estate space. Um, also in marketing tech, think um, applications trying to create recreate Salesforce on the blockchain. And the list goes on. We even get into some niche spaces, which would be like um, wine trade industry, as well as agriculture, sort of like um, layering uh, satellite imagery to be able to put that on the blockchain for um, bringing, um, what was it? Um, bringing insurance directly to small time farmers. And so there's a lot of different use cases out there. Um, and yeah, so gaming is not the only one that we work with. All right, another question for Brian. Um, what do you see as a main use case for crypto raves in the future? In the future, I, I see as a sort of combination of what I demonstrated with the leaderboard, plus um, one of the original ideas of crypto raves was like tokenize your social value. Um, so a way, uh, it's kind of a way to capture, um, both, well, two things capture, um, sort of a social credit or rep create it, make it into a reputation type token. I think over time, um, we work out how it can get gamed, et cetera. Um, mm -hmm. it, it can be sort of, uh, a pseudo low level identity solution using since it was sort of with that lack of better words, KYC through big social media. Um, so the identity portion, so it, it could sort of create, you'll have like a, a, a network of users that hold your tokens. And if you look at that as a sort of a social network within, it's kind of like a followers or, or just people in your network that are holding your token. Um, I, I see that if, if you grow big enough, we can measure away we get have a metric that says hey this token is really big and you know could be valuable to folks we want to work in a, a part of the the measuring algorithm to um if if you say uh, or a newer user and just launched per se by getting someone's token who has a very valuable uh network um would boost your your token value on that sort of leaderboard metric um, so I, I, I could see anything from like secondary markets opening up um, for some of these tokens, um, as well as any other future uh, blockchain um, functionality like DAOs. Why, why not launch a DAO with a tweet? Uh, uh, and why not um, do voting, you know, uh, things of these nature, um, certain other other yeah, voting with tokens, et cetera. So um really i see a lot of possibilities um yeah. so the main use case also we look at like competitors not just like social tokens but also uh, tip bots so when i explained earlier that like we want to see all erc20s be able to move in and out and, and since we're the most we would be decentralized i see nothing stopping um, us but from being like the top go-to for um tipping as I guarantee our, our fees will be low to possibly non-existent. Um, so uh, th those are the two main use cases I see in the future. Um, so whichever yeah. one most interesting. Yeah, I think, Brian, there's also an opportunity with games. I mean, the ability to run Absolutely. distributions of NFTs, time-based promotions. I do this and you get an NFT, right? Uh, that's usable in a real game, right? And just to be able to do that in a social platform like you have is, seems like a really cool use case. So maybe that's we could talk. Right. Yeah, yeah. That's maybe we could talk about that. That's good. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Can I wanted to go to that question? I know I dropped off there for a second. So uh, from Ken, um, it's really uh, a, how the game wants to do it. Um, the API basically gives them control where they can, you know, the, the idea of minting a pack that's got hidden stuff is really on the game because essentially when someone, if you go through a uh, in-game experience and you click on buy for a pack, 
um, at that point, they could call the API and mint randomized um, items because they're going to know these different items that are available in their own database for their game, and they could randomize it at that point of uh, of purchase. So it's really up to them how they want to do it, uh, or they could have a token that is is sort of a uh, representative of a pack and later gets exchanged for um, you know, in-game items. It, it's on them to do it how they want. We just give them the tools to build. Awesome. And that's like there was another question um, for you too about um, what kind of transactions do you plan to register on the side chain? For us, it's definitely the NFT um, related transactions. So, you know, I want to sell this transact or this item for this amount of tokens, right? So a non-fungible token is, the idea is a unique, an NFT, we mentioned that, we probably should have said what it is. Um, it's a non-fungible token, and that means it's basically unique. Like, so you could have a non-fungible token that represents the the real estate of your house, right? Um, the, the deed of your house. Your house is unique. It may be, look like the one next door, but it's a u- unique latitude, longitude, and, you know, street address and you know it's uniquely yours until you sell it right so that's an nft whereas a um uh, and like an erc20 is if you have one token and i have one token they're equal and they're equivalent uh so so uh the nfts do well in games even though you could have nfts that are the same uh you, uh, you can also have them different where something gains experience over time evolves over time uh, however you want to do that. All right. And looks like one more follow-up question, Matt. Um, in order to be able to define the value of an asset, an FT, do you have to create it from scratch or can you purchase assets from outside libraries and then increase their value? So I think, so the game defines what an NFT is. I mean, I've kind of given some examples like a card, it could be clothes that you wear. It could be whatever you want. Um, the The value comes. So the value is kind of, you know, if you think of like a baseball card, when you first buy it, it has the value of all of that they put into it, manufacturing it and producing it and, and marketing it to you. Um, and then you buy it and it becomes yours or a magic card. Same sort of concept. It becomes yours. It's only collectible after the fact in that it may have a certain amount of rarity versus everything else. So the value is really a market driven thing based on rarity, based on demand. We don't, our platform really won't have anything to do with the value. It's really how rare does a game want to make something? It could be, there's only one of that item in the entire game for a million players. Right. And so it becomes super rare. And if it's really cool, there's a huge demand for it. And so the value of it could go up. So like anything, value is consensus based. What do people think it's worth and what are people willing to pay essentially? So um, we don't decide the value of anything. It's going to be all market driven and it's going to be all game driven based on. And so we're going to help the games figure out the economy side of things. We have folks that, that think on those lines. Um, One of our advisors is Richard Garfield who invented magic um, so we have, and Paul Barclay, who worked for Wizards of the Coast, so we're, we have people who think on uh, those lines about economies and, and collectible items. And so we're really excited about once this hits the ground and runs, what, what you can do to promote things and build communities and let players run their own stores, run their own, um, you know, however they want to do it, sell things. Uh, uh, it, it, it's kind of op- open-ended in that sense. Awesome. And then um, last question. This was for you, Brian. Um, do you think people will ever um, use crypto raise for initial offerings on Twitter? Hey, hey, hey. I hope so. <laughs> I think there's absolutely nothing stopping that. So why not? I say I, I would be I'd be flattered. In fact, <laughs> depends on where the project goes. But yeah, I think that would be that would be pretty um, interesting, to say the least. Awesome. Awesome. Thanks for that. I think that was Joseph's. Thanks, Joseph. Yeah, definitely from Joseph. 
Okay, since we're running out of time, I think um, the last thing um, uh, we would like to do is just like wrap it up with just how people can get in contact with you. And then also just like a piece of advice or best practice for the audience. Um, and if not a piece of advice or best practice, what can people look forward to for the future of your projects? Okay, so I think, um, yep, you can just at Crypto Raves on Twitter, feel free to DM, check out our website, CryptoRaves.space. Um, a, a fun way, a, a fun way to game the crypto raves leaderboard metric. Um, if anybody gives you tokens, give some back with yours. Um, we found that reciprocating scores a lot higher. We have research to back that up. So a little pointer there. Um, oh, that will pop up there. Um, so yeah, uh, enjoy crypto raves, drop your crypto. If you haven't already, be looking forward to seeing you on there and feel free to reach out. So thank you for your attention. Awesome. Yeah, so, uh, you know, for us, um, you can go to our website, gamecredits.org and check out, you know, just the platform, what it's all about. Um, I think, you know, I think it starts with going through, you know, I think, you know, solving problems that users care about and then, you know, doing the due diligence of assessing what is the right solution. Like, I think sometimes people get caught up in the hype of things, but they don't do like, uh, you know, what what am I doing for my players that helps them, right? What In terms of our platform, I think we're trying to we're trying to enable communities. We, we mentioned the tournaments. We mentioned you know, people being able to sell their items to exit games that they don't want to play anymore on a secondary market. Maybe they don't get back all the money they put in, but they get back part of it. Those sort of things, you know, are real problems that people have, and we want to enable communities to do that. So I think from if you're developing an app, find a real problem. Don't focus on the solution first. Focus on the problem that you want to solve, and then, um, you know, Platforms like Scale enable you to solve that problem. You know where you can do fast transactions or you can do storage on on chain. So I think um, seeing seeing the problems and then solving it with the right solution is really the most important thing. And I think there's a lot of people solving problems in blockchain that probably could be solved other ways. You know, a centralized solution. But then there's other ones where, yeah, it's definitely this is a great opportunity to use blockchain and, and decentralized um, transactions is really would be really good for that sort of thing. So. Awesome. And thanks, guys. It was really great having a panel with both of you. Um, thanks for, you know, all the advice for those in attendance. Um, so again, thanks for joining the, the Skill Labs migration, uh, migrating your dApps. And so if you're interested in understanding more about how to migrate, um, please go to scale.network and reach out to us there. And we'll get back to you as soon as possible. All right, everyone. Have a great night. Thanks, Christine. Thanks, Gail. Bye. Bye.